Okay, guys, let's get started. So today's webinar is about creative photography. And we're going to talk about creative photography. And we're going to talk about this in conjunction with all the creative tools you have at your disposal. So before we get started, I wanted to tell you guys that uh, whatever you hear today is in some way or shape going to be part of our special offer that uh, we're running on visual wilderness. And I think one of the co-hosts can put in a link to that. And if you're interested in finding out more about what you learned today, you can go to the special offer and grab one of the tutorials. You can also grab a streaming service subscription for 33% off um, with a discount code that somebody's going to put into the chat box. The discount code is N2020. And trust me, I'm hoping everybody's going to like that discount code because we do want to end 2020. All right, so let's start out with a question. Uh, before I start out with a question, let me share with you a little bit of agenda. So who's going to present today? Um, we are, my name is Jay Patel and my wife, Marina Patel. We own Visual Wilderness. All the photographers that are presenting here are our partners and they put in just as much work on visual wilderness as we do. And Austin, Kate, and Ugo are going to be presenting today. Uh, we have other partners who also present. So if you are interested in finding out about more about our webinars, please make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter. Okay. All right. So now let's start out by asking the question, what is creative photography? Well, this is not an easy definition of to give you what is a creative photography because it's subjective. What is creative for me is not going to be the same as what is creative for Kate or Ugo or for some of you, right? So when we were trying to create a creative photography tutorial, Vray and I had a pretty good discussion and some of that was pretty testy. Uh, because we didn't agree on creative photography definition. So in the end, we sort of came to an agreement saying this is what creative photography is. So I'm going to share with you a video of what we think creative photography is. And so here's Verena. So let me open this video up. So let's see, I'll share this video screen now. So let's see. New share. All right. Tell me if you guys hear the song. Yep, we're good, Jay. Creative photography is notoriously difficult to define. Jay and I actually had a long conversation trying to work out a clean definition of creativity. In the end, we decided that creativity is about expression. It's about experimentation, discovery, the joy of creation. Creative photography is about pushing boundaries and looking outside of the normal photographic process. Maybe you're arranging elements in your composition in an unexpected way. Maybe you're using natural elements like water or light or foliage in an unexpected way. Maybe you're using camera settings that you wouldn't normally use or equipment that you haven't used before. Push your boundaries, think outside the box, and more importantly than anything else, have fun. A lot of times when we're working in the field, Jay and I will take a couple of initial shots of our subject to get to know it a little bit, and then we'll start to push our creativity. Maybe we'll decide to underexpose our image intentionally in order to create a more moody feel. Or we might overexpose in order to create an airy, light feeling. Creative choices often happen in the moment. So run with it. Don't be afraid to try something new. Here's some shots that Jay took in Fiji of a crab. It was a beautiful portrait of these gorgeous red crabs in their natural habitat. But he wanted to take it further. So he watched these little creatures for a while. And he noticed that when waves splashed ashore, the crabs would cling to the rocks in order to avoid being swept away. So he started to pay close attention to the waves and he was able to capture a series of fun photographs of these crabs fighting the elements. In one photo, you can see the wave 
ready to crash against the crab. In another photo, you see the wave as it hits the crab. He's clinging to the rock, but not moving. In another shot, the crab is overcome by the wave and covered in bubbles. And in the final photo in the series, the crab is almost abstract. Jay calls this one crabstract. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> OK, sorry. <laughs> In order to capture this fun series of photographs, Jay used a long lens, a very fast shutter speed, and a little bit of creativity. So let's talk about the broad variety of options that you have to take your photography a little bit further. All right, so I wanted to see if you guys have any questions. Um, let me go back to my uh, presentation. So. There we go. All right. See if you guys have any questions so far. <laughs> yeah, right now I was having fun at my expense, which happens a lot. Um, anyway, so two things to take away from that video. Um, one of the things is that, hey, creative photography is subjective. And creative photography requires two things, an intent means you really have to try something different and something outside your normal workflow. So an experimentation, okay? So without these two things, it just becomes a normal part of your workflow. So it's not very creative. So when you define something like this, what it allows you to do is it allows you to see things differently. All right, so let's see. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, these are the same, this photo was taken at the same location in Iceland in two different years. Now, the photo that you see on the right um, is creative photo. The photo you see on the left is non-creative photo. Now the question is why? Well, the photo you see on the left is a traditional landscape photo. I took the photo with the intent of getting everything sharply in focus, highlighting the location, the flower, and all my camera settings, everything was done as if I was a regular landscape photographer, right? And that became really not very creative for me. The photo that you see on the left used number of steps that were outside my normal workflow. First of all, I used a really selective focus. I only focused on the church. Everything else is sort of blurred out. Then I used a special lens. This little glow that you see on the church is, is not an effect that was created in Photoshop. It is actually in-camera effect created by Lens Baby. And then um, I went a little bit further. I aperture bracketed this photo and I take several different apertures to create this different glow, different depth of field, different kind of details in different areas. And then I put it together in Photoshop to create this image. So this image looks, has a number of different creative options all the way from post-processing to cameras to equipment, right? So that is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about creative photography. At least that is a definition we're gonna use for this particular webinar, okay? Now, let's talk a little more about what is a creative toolkit. Now, how do you be, how do you think creatively like this, right? Well, it's not always easy to be creative and be a landscape photographer because let's face it, landscape photographer rely on these things to be creative. Like in the photo that you see previously, I, I went there during the season when it was flowering. So I knew that flowers were gonna grow. I had great clouds. I had great geology, good lighting, good weather to work with and everything worked out. This is, these are the things that you don't always control, right? These are the things you cannot control. This is not in your control. We've been to Iceland where it rained for seven straight days, right? And you still have to come up with a photo. So what are the things in your creative toolkits that you can control, right? So these are the things in the creative toolkits that you can control. This is in your hands, the choice of the lenses, choice of camera setting, post-processing, equipment, uh, photography gear, 
composition and subject, what to shoot, how to shoot, right? These are all the things that you control. So the, our course or tutorial that is on sale is going to teach you how to take the things that you can control out of your creative toolkit and use it outside your normal workflow. And use it in conjunction of the things that you can control, which are these things. So no matter what these things do, whether there's clouds or no clouds or light or no light, you should be able to use the things that you can control in your creative toolkits and be creative. So I'll give you an example. Do you see the background behind me? I'm sitting in a helicopter. This is actually a bubble helicopter. Well, I'm not really sitting on it, but it's just projected on the green screen. And notice the light in behind me, right? It's blue sky. There's hardly any clouds in the sky. And we paid a ton of money to rent this helicopter. And why did we do that? Well, we wanted to take a photo like this. So this is a photo that was taken from this helicopter that you see that I'm sitting on. And yes, that is live. That is actually Verena Patel. Um, and that is Verena Patel standing and marooned on a, a sandbar, which is no more than maybe 100 feet by 50 feet, right? And we specifically rented this helicopter in the middle of the day around one o'clock or two o'clock, something like that. And we went there because the sun was directly overhead and I wanted to take photos like that. And you can tell by the shadow, which is almost underneath Verena, right? So, so these are the things that is outside our normal flow. And this is what happens. Now, I know some of you may be thinking that, hey, what about uh, you, you can only take photos like this if you are in tropical island in Fiji and there's a sandbar nearby and you have enough money to rent a helicopter. Well, not quite. Here are all the things that, all the photos that were taken without using golden hours, right? Under a variety of lighting conditions in variety of locations all over the world, right? So there's a photo from Peru, which was taken in the middle of the day again. Uh, there's a photo from Iceland. You see glacial river abstract that is flowing, which is taken from an airplane. There's a photo from Utah desert, a plant growing out. There's a photo from Canada bit, uh, after a forest fire, which was taken right in the middle of the day. In fact, we took that photo of the dead trees looking straight up. Okay. And also a photo of the valley, which was taken from a, just side of the road, we were driving past and we came across this valley and I jumped out and took a shot. And this photo of sea anemone, it was taken standing in mud with a small pool which had these sea anemones in it. And I have a video actually um, somewhere on Visual Wilderness, if you guys go look for it, that Verena did that shows you how she ended up capturing that photo. Okay, so Creativity allows you to take photos that you may not always get if you just concentrate on being a landscape photographer and don't shoot anything outside golden hours, okay? So make sure that you actually take that lesson from you. So let's take a look at a real life case study, right? So here's an Iceland photo. These are two Iceland shots taken in two different years. One of the years when we went to Iceland, um, I think this was in 2013, we got some great clouds, great location, my button, and all these things are going on. And we were able to capture sunrise with uh, backlit mist, right? That's the photo that you see on the left. Well, a few years later, we ran on workshop and this is what we got. Overcast skies, flat lighting, there was nothing good to shoot or was there. So how do you take a photo when you are at a location like this and say one of those creative variables that you're counting on don't cooperate with you? So let's take another video and see how that works, okay? So I'm gonna open this video in here. Let me share the video screen again. Tell me if somebody 
if you yep, guys hear good. the sound. All right. So when we were in Iceland, we came across this geothermal areas that are really very well known in Iceland. This Myvatn region is known for some phenomenal geothermal activities. There are mud cracks and the colors are just awesome. And then there are these boiling mud pots that just bubble mud. It is sort of like bluish gray mud that is all over the place. And it's they're fascinating to look at because there's steam rising from them and the mud just keeps bubbling and exploding. So when you're in a place like this, a lot of times you are very overwhelmed with all the things that are going on. And as landscape photographers, we always like to shoot with wide angle lenses or slow shutter speed. But this is a place where you can create some fantastic abstracts with fast shutter speed and a long lens. So let me walk you through what we did when we were at this location. So the equipment I used was 70 to 200 millimeter lens and a full frame camera. And the thing I was trying to capture are exploding bubbles as they explode. I wanted to freeze the motion of the bubbles. So I needed a really fast shutter speed. The shutter speed I was trying to use was about one to thousandth of a second or higher. So that as the bubble exploded, that explosion can be captured and the motion of those exploding bubbles are frozen. This location is particularly suited for capturing photos like this. The bubbles, first of all, explode in the same place. So we don't have to worry about focusing really fast as the bubble is exploding. And because they explode in the same place, you can use your long lens, pre-focus on the part where the bubble is exploding, and then set up your camera settings, and then fire away. The other thing that is really cool about this location is that it is readily accessible. If the bubbles are too far away, where they appear really small on your camera, or you can't really see them because they're fairly deep in the ground, then a shot like this is almost impossible to take. So this location had all the characteristics of capturing a high-speed photograph with a long lens. So first of all, I decided to get my focusing correct. So I set up the camera, I selected the composition with a long lens, and I used a single focusing point. And I moved that focusing point where the bubble was exploding and then set my focus. Once my focus was set, I switched to manual focus. What this allowed me to do is I didn't have to worry about the focus as the bubbles exploded. And then I had to select my exposure. Now, it was a really cloudy day, but the clouds were moving very fast and there was a broken cloud cover. So one of the techniques I use when light conditions are changing like this is to use an auto ISO. Now, my aperture at this point was not very critical. I needed a very high shutter speed. So I started with setting my shutter speed to one two thousandth of a second. And then I selected my aperture. I could get away with f4 aperture, but I wanted slightly more depth of field because I was fairly close to the bubbles and I wanted to capture the entire bubble sharply in focus. Now, that means that I needed to use aperture somewhere around 5.6 or f8. And that's where I set my aperture. Then I decided to change my shooting mode from a two second timer, which I normally use, to a high speed shooting mode. So as the bubble is exploding, I can take several shots and catch them in action. So I set my camera using those exposure settings. One two thousandth of a second shutter speed, which was very critical. Uh, an aperture, which was slightly away from f4, so around f5.6 or f8, and auto ISO. Now my focus is set up, my exposure is set up. All I had to do was look at the back of my camera on the LCD, and as soon as the bubble started to explode, fire away a few shots. But creativity is not only limited to your camera settings. Remember, when you have a bubble that you're trying to capture and is exploding in the foreground and your focus and your aperture are set 
to capture the bubble, rest of the area in your scene is going to be out of focus. Well, if you really want to capture the textures of all the things that are happening in the scene, one of the things you can do is, once you get a few bubble shots, you can then change your selective focus points, move them around, and catch all the other areas. Because remember, they're all static, they're not moving. The only thing that is moving in your scene is the bubbles. And then you can later stack them in Photoshop to create a super sharp image with the details that can be seen throughout. So that is exactly what I ended up doing. Now, whether to use those photos to create a sharp image or let the rest of the background fade out is a creative choice you can make in post-processing. Once you've captured the bubbles and all the shots, that's an easy choice to make. The other thing that I noticed was the bubbles in my scene were exploding at two different locations. So it is possible that you can capture bubbles from one location, then take your focus point, move it to the second location, wait for the bubbles to explode in that location and capture the scene, and then you can combine these in the post-processing. So in summary, when you are using a creative shutter speed and a long lens to create fine art abstract, don't just stop thinking creatively in terms of your camera setting. Go beyond the camera settings and look at what else can you do creatively in a location like this. And you'll come away with some fantastic photos. All right. So, any questions for me? All right. If there are any questions, um, I'm going to continue. If you guys do have questions, put them in the chat box, and I will uh, I will try to answer them after my thing is done. So, when you're out in the field, the way creative photography works is we have these toolkits that we showed you about like these ones. And for every one of them, we have a list of things we can do that is outside our normal workflow. And we have accumulated that over the experience of shooting with 20 years of experience. And then we kind of carry it around with us. And when we find an opportunity where we find things that are not in our control, like the light and weather, when an opportunity presents themselves, we will pull out one of those things that we have done in the past and use it as part of our creative workflow. And that is how a creative toolkit works, okay? So um, again, there's a lot more about creative toolkits in our tutorials, if you guys are interested in learning, but let's continue with our webinar and say, what else can we do? So the next up on the agenda is Austin. Um, and Austin is gonna present his creative workflow and how he looks at things and comes up with things that are different. But before we do that, I um, need to give a shout out to Frederick Van Johnson and This Week in Photo for being partners with us in this free webinar. Um, we hope to do more with them in future, so stay tuned. So Fred, if you're listening, uh, sorry, Frederick, if you're listening, uh, Welcome and thank you for uh, giving a shout out to our free webinar. All right. Having said that, I am going to turn this over to Austin. Austin, are you ready? Yep, I am. All right. So um, I'll stop the share and Austin, it's the screen is yours. Right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Let me everybody's size. All right. So um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, some creative effects for nature photography um, via post-processing. So Jay just had a great um, little presentation there on some creative effects you can do in the field. I'm going to be talking about some post-processing things that you can do. Um, so I'm just going to go over a few brief slides, then I'm actually going to show a little demo in Photoshop. So we'll knock out the slides right now. Um, so what are creative effects, first of all, um, for post-processing? Basically, I like to define it as simple workflows that you can apply to your photos. Uh, they're done in Photoshop for the purpose of this tutorial. 
Um, and they're more complex than just a simple slider. So this is going to be something a little more complex than just reducing the highlights or increasing the shadows or something like that. <clears throat> so why should we use creative effects? Um, you have more creative freedom in your photo, um, as well as you can apply these special effects for an advanced look. Um, and they're simple steps with a great payoff. This is going to allow you to replicate some things. Maybe you didn't get the best conditions in the field, and there are going to be some ways that you can kind of improve your photos that way. So I'm going to show you a few examples of creative effects. Um, I actually just recently created a tutorial on some Photoshop workflows with creative effects. And so in that tutorial, I'm going to show you things like the Orton effect. Um, and in that tutorial, it's really focused on the Orton effect, but I show you how I edit the whole photo. So this is my raw file, and this is my finished edited file. And that is all in that tutorial. Um, but basically, I talk a lot about the Orton effect, which is something that I use to create a little glow in my scene. You can see on this right side here, all this glow is something that I created here, um, which is not um, there in my raw file. So the Orton effect adds glow. I teach you exactly how to do that in the tutorial. Um, I also talk about saturation masks. These are something that um, <clears throat> is a really advanced te technique that a lot of pro photographers are using. So in a scene like this, uh, you can see how... I've got lots of different oranges, and then it even goes into a shade of blue over here. So I use a saturation mask, which is just basically a layer mask, um, but I use saturation instead of like luminosity values. That's going to allow me to even out the saturation because you can see on my image to the right here, my final image, the scene is very well balanced orange. If I uh, grab this raw file and just increase the saturation, you would see that it's a lot oranger over here than it is over here. But in my final scene, using a saturation mask, I was able to balance that out. So that's another technique that I show you. Um, then I show star glow. This helps you add dimension to your night photos. Basically what the star glow is here, is you can see how these stars over here are glowing just a little bit. It kind of gives the scene a little bit more dimension. Um, and so that is something that's pretty simple to add. And I show you exactly how to do that. Um, and then I also show you how to add some local contrast. So this is something um, that is a little hard to see when you're zoomed all the way out, but it kind of helps me bring out the trees a little bit and make things pop. So just using a few simple steps, I can apply what is called a local contrast adjustment to bring out the detail and textures. So now I'm going to show you guys a demo here <clears throat> um, on warping. So um, there is definitely a lot of talk about warping, whether you should do it, whether you shouldn't do it on your images. Um, no matter what you think, I'm going to show you how to do it. Um, and then if you want to do it on your own, go ahead. And if, uh, if you're not one for warping, that's okay. One thing that I will say is that if you shoot with a wide angle lens, um, go, you can even try it just in your house. If you point at something in the very center of your wide angle lens versus if something is at the top of your frame, um, it's going to be a quite a large difference because things at the edge of the frame get stretched. So we can use warping to correct that. Um, that would be the most simple form of warping. And we can also use warping for kind of a creative effect, which is a little bit of what I'm going to be showing you today. So I've got this raw image here and it looks all right. But the thing about it is that kind of my subject here, which is this mountain is a little boring. Um, it, it's not very dominant in the frame. And you can also see that the kind of the horizon here appears to be tilted to the right. So rather than just tilting my image and cropping it, I'm actually going to make this mountain a little more prominent here by using a warp. So what I want to do here is do, go and click on my layer here. Um, and I'll make a new layer just so that we can have a copy here. I'll call it warp. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm going to drag this down here. I'm going to call this warp. <clears throat> so now what you're going to do is hit Command T on a Mac, or that's going to be Control T on a PC. And then you're going to control click on a Mac or right click on a PC and hit warp. And that is going to bring up the option for you to warp. So you can see now I've got kind of a crop, uh, a crop square or rectangle around my image. And I've got these little handles here. So if I pull these handles out, it'll pull the image. But I can also click and warp on the image itself. So I always like to think about what I want to do before I actually do it, um, just so that I kind of have a good direction. So what I want to do is balance this frame a little more. So I want to kind of even out the horizon here, um, and I want to make this mountain more prominent. So I want to make the mountain a little bit taller. So I need to either bring the left side down or bring the right side up or both. Um, and I always recommend just try out warping and kind of drag your image around and see what you like. And just try it on a few of your images just to kind of learn how it works. But most of the time, I'm going to be dragging from these handles. 
And so I can drag from the handles here. I can drag from the middle of the image. And I'm just going to drag this up. Maybe I'll drag from right here. And again, I just want to kind of balance my horizon here. You can see it's dipped down a little bit to the right. So I can pull this up. I could pull this over. There's really a variety of things that you could do. Um, and you will notice that I am a little zoomed out. So in Photoshop, normally you'll probably be zoomed in about this far on your image, which doesn't give you a lot of dragging freedom. So you can click Command minus on a Mac or Control minus on a PC to zoom out so that you have some freedom to grab your handlebars here. Um, and you can just pull this around. So there's a variety of things that I would do to this. Um, but just for sake of kind of this, this webinar here, I'll keep it short and just show you that. I've also got two other photos I want to show you a little technique on. So I'm going to hit enter here, though, and we can toggle the before and after. <clears throat> and you will see that it does make a little bit of a difference here in terms. So when I zoom in here. So you can see that we've created more of a subject here. And yes, it is a little bit uh, wonky to the right. I'd likely go back and fix that. But you get the idea here. I've really kind of increased the uh, prominence of our subject here, which is this mountain. I've made it look a little bit cooler because it is a little steeper. So that's one way to kind of add interest to your scene um, that maybe you got good light, but the subject wasn't that interesting. So you can add a little interest doing that. Now, another reason why you may want to warp, I'm going to show you on this photo here, is if you want to get rid of a problem spot on the edge of your frame. So this is a shot that I took in Death Valley. Um, I loved the light on this dune. This is uh, kind of the last light of the night. And then over here, it's dark because it's in the shadow. So you can see that this is kind of the, uh, the crest of the dune, I guess. <clears throat> but the problem is I have this big spot of sky. And now you're probably thinking, why did you shoot it like that? Um, there was no other way that I could shoot this composition without having this in the corner of the frame. Now, the problem with cropping this is that I'm going to lose a lot of my curve because I'd have to crop it about right here. I'm going to lose this last curve at the top. So instead, what I'm going to do is actually warp this to warp that corner out. Now, the one thing you do have to be careful of when you're warping is that if you do a ton of warping, it's going to reduce the sharpness on your image. Um, but generally speaking, Photoshop is pretty good these days with um, maintaining that quality. So again, I'm just going to do Command T on a Mac, Control T on a PC. Then I'm going to Control click on a Mac or right click on a PC. And I'm going to click Warp. I'm going to zoom out here. And I'm just going to work this up and over. Again, I don't want to go one direction too aggressively here, but I can bring this out just like that. So <clears throat> now that area is too big to do uh, a spot heal or a clone stamp on, which is the reason why I'm warping it here. But now you can see that uh, just that one simple step has really simplified my photo because um, and of course, this is everyone can have their own opinion, but I think that the blue sky really hurts this image right here. Uh, it makes it much more of a simpler shot by doing this simple warp. So the last thing that I want to show you here is on this image. I just want to show you kind of an image where I can warp the whole thing. And this is a raw file here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this again. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to pull up the warp. And now the thing, this is already a pretty well, um, a pretty good composition, but I want to make the mountain a little bit more prominent as well as the flowers. So I want the flowers to span more of my scene. So let's go ahead and pull this over a little bit. And then I can just start kind of pushing things around here. Um, one thing that is really not interesting about my scene, I always want to do everything I can to get rid of things that aren't interesting in the scene. And it's these rocks right here. So what I can do is actually click and drag um, from somewhere in the center here. And I can reduce the size of this. Now you want to make sure that you don't drag inside of um, your frame here. So always make sure that the lines are touching or outside of your image frame. Otherwise, as you can see, you're going to have whatever layers under showing through. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to increase the prominence and height of my mountain. Now, the mountain's also leaning to the right. Um, so you could pull it to the left if you want. Now, of course, um, this is definitely a little bit of digital manipulation. As I mentioned before, if you don't like doing that, um, you definitely 
don't need to feel obligated to, to do it. This is a technique though that I like for, I like to recreate the scene kind of how, how I remember it in, in the field. And because I shot this with a wide angle lens, the mountain kind of looks a little puny um, com as compared to what I saw in the field. And this is in Olympic National Park. Uh, I remember this huge mountain in front of me, uh, this beautiful field of flowers. And it's hard to convey that with a wide angle lens to get the whole scene. So that is really why I want to warp here. And you can kind of bring this up, watch the corners on the bottom. Maybe I'll pull this over and somewhere like that. So you could spend a lot more time um, fudging around with the sides and whatnot <clears throat> and pushing things back and forth, but I think that's looking pretty good. So you can see here, this is the before image and this is after. So I've greatly improved uh, the prominence of my flowers, first of all. <clears throat> and I've also made the mountain look a lot more stout, which uh, in photography is generally a good thing. Uh, at least for my, my kind of photography, I love shooting things that look really rugged and I've made the mountain steeper, uh, a little bit taller and more pointy. So <clears throat> that kind of wraps up um, how I go about warping. Again, uh, I will just reiterate in case you wanted to write it down, um, you make a new layer, click Command T on a Mac or Control T on a PC. Then you're going to Control click on a Mac or right click on a PC and click warp and that will bring things up and you can start pushing and pulling your image around to help you create a composition more similar to what you remembered in the field or if you like creating um, complete digital composites this is a great tool for that as well um, so that really wraps up my demo i'm happy to answer any questions if there is any <clears throat> stop the share I think you're, oh, there you go. Yeah, thanks Austin. Um, don't believe there are any questions at this point in time, but if you guys do have questions, please uh, feel free to ask them. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna take this technique and put it in as part of Austin's tutorial. So I send a link to everybody to see where they wanna purchase a tutorial form. And he actually also has star glow technique, Orton effect, everything um, described that he described today in the tutorial as well. All right. So thanks, Austin. So next up is Kate. Now, remember, there are times where we go out in the field and we look at it and say, oh, here's this great scene, but I wish it was more artistic. I wish it was X, right? X is whatever you want. Well, I can tell you that there are some things that just stand out as being works of art. I go to a local hospital and when I go in the hallway, I see all these photographs that are in the hallway, but they're not normal photographs. They are processed as tiny planets. So we have a series of tiny planets as I walk down the hallway to get my allergy shots. And I just thought that was so cool. And each one of them in itself looks pretty ordinary. But when you work with a plugin, when you work with artistic effect, it looks phenomenal. So Kate here is going to demonstrate how to make things look phenomenal. That's a lot of faith right there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Kate, it's all they yours. They thought they're going to be phenomenal be quiet. or a little crazy. So, <laughs> all righty, can you all see my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, I just have a, a, a few examples here that I kind of pulled together to uh, play with. So I don't really have a keynote. I'm just going to jump right into uh, one of these is a, a raw file. I've converted them to JPEG to hopefully uh, not slow me down at all. But um, I typically work with uh, my raw files. <clears throat> and you'll have to excuse me, I think I'm coming down with something, which figures I always do around my birthday. Um, so I'm going to work with this one right here. I found this on uh, my hard drive, and it was just one of those things that, you know, caught my eye when I was in the field, and I, I never really processed. So I was like, oh, I'll just try and do something fun uh, with this for this uh, presentation here. So 
This is uh, an image from uh, Valley of Fire State Park. And do you guys see the face right here? Uh, yeah, actually yeah, you can. It? Yeah. <laughs> I, I never <laughs> now noticed that you it. Now something, we can't it, see it. <laughs> it does. It's like I never noticed it before, but there's like a little face right here. Anyway, um, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Uh, so something like this, it's, it's interesting. I like the forms. I like the contrast. Um, I like the shadows. It just, it, it just felt like it needed something. Um, I took it into the develop module and I, I played with, uh, you know, some of the sliders and the clarity and texture and, and things like that. But um, what I ended up doing was uh, I'm going to bring this into uh, Silver Effects Pro, but I'm going to bring it in through Photoshop. Um, and the reason that I do that is, let me get this out of here. Okay. Um, is so that I can have whatever I do in Silver Effects as a layer. Um, the Nix software, after the latest update uh, from Lightroom, you can actually reopen it again. Uh, the Color Effects Pro, Silver Effects Pro, all of those things, and, and make corrections. But what I really like to have available is things like blending modes and masking and um, opacity changes and things like that. So that's why I. Uh, I come into uh, Photoshop first. So I'm just going to open up Silver Effects Pro. <clears throat> and it did this to me last time, y'all. Sorry. If you drag the window, the Silver Effects Pro window away um, right behind it, I think it will say that Nick Collection needs an update. Drag it like way off your frame. I just updated it. <laughs> like every day, I feel like, honestly. That's usually what works for me. But if not, I'm not sure. It is, it has decided to freeze up everything. So I apologize, Jay. No worries. Do you want to? Try this out and I'll have Ugo go first. We can swap the order out. Hang on, let me just see if this works. All right. Because we have real we have options. We can we can make things. I can actually show some more videos and quiz people about how did I take the photo. All right, give me 30 seconds. All right. <laughs> and we'll try this again without the explanation, here we go. Um, sometimes it's the, the NIC uh, selective tool and not the NIC program itself. So we'll see if this works. Nah -ha -ha. <laughs> yeah, it's a there selective go. tool. All right, no more selected tool for me today. Okay, so um, what I typically do here is like I come in and, and Kind of check out some of the presets because you know i mean presets are they're a good starting point uh and so i played with this this morning and what did i end up with uh i think it was full dynamic range harsh which is actually not something that i normally use uh, but i really liked the way that it kind of balanced out the fact that the top portion was darker than the bottom portion but it really brought out uh, the textures that I was interested in and the contrast. And I kind of like the green filter. It darkens it just a little bit. So I'm clicking that green filter right there. And I might just do a little bit of copper toning, copper tone, <laughs> and click OK. Oh, there we go. And so that's my Nick layer. And what I like about doing it in Photoshop is I get the option of coming down here and running through the blending mode, which is a lot of fun. Um, luminosity, when you use Silver Effects Pro, Pro, luminosity is actually pretty cool because it will apply that whole kind of grunge look that I just went for, but it gets rid of the black and white color. So here's without it and here's with it. 
Um, so even if you're not interested in turning it into a black and white, sometimes it's fun to use that program just to get that, uh, that layer and that look. But I think it's nice. It's a, it's a different way of looking at the same subject. Um, and I think it's an improvement. All right, so moving on. I'm gonna take these two and I'm gonna open them up in Photoshop because of course it's only gonna open up one, isn't it? There it is. Okay, so this is one of those situations where I was photographing uh, this wisteria and this bee just happened to come in and I've got a bunch of different photos with him kind of hopping all over the place. Um, but the settings that I was using in order to get a fast shutter speed, um, I had kind of a, a wide aperture. And so this little piece right here is out of focus and something like that I would want to fix. So while I was in the field, I took another shot of this piece right here in focus. So I am going to blend those by putting one on top of the other. And I'm gonna lower the opacity so I can make sure that these line up exactly where they should be. It's a little off. And that was just based on where I was standing and what I was doing. And I think I, I, think I picked up and left and then came back when the bee came back. And that's why it's not uh, lined up perfectly because I'm always on a tripod. Okay. And so now all I have to do is add a mask and take my brush and I don't want my logo. How about a regular brush? And 100% opacity. This is gonna be a little bit sloppy. I don't wanna take up all of your time, but I'm gonna bring the nice in focus one back. And I'm just gonna do a quick crop here. There we go. Now, something like this, I thought, you know, my typical workflow is to make it look nice, you know, make it look normal and nice. And then I'll look at it and go, okay, is, am I happy with that? Or do I want to take it further? And something like this, I'll either try a, a texture or maybe a painterly look or maybe both. And so I'm going to open up uh, this texture and bring it and just see what it looks like. Okay. Yep. There we go. My move tool and I'm going to drag it and I'm going to drop it right on top of him. And it's pretty big. I, I sized down that B photo so I could work nicely in here. So I'm going to make this fit and you don't have to, you don't always have to make it fit. You can do whatever you want. And there we go. And so here I'm going to go running through my blending modes and see if anything just kind of jumps out at me. Not really jumping. So I'm going to go back to normal and add a mask. And again, I'm doing this faster than I normally would, but I don't want to bore y'all. So here we go. I'm going to do about a 20% mask and I'm just going to start tapping to reveal this little guy behind here. And I'm going to make my brush a little bit smaller. When I lower the opacity of the brush, it makes it makes it so that you can do this really nice uh, soft transitions and then I can kind of click and drag and reveal what I want. And if I want more of him, I can either raise the opacity of the brush or I can just kind of tap in the same spot a bunch of times. And that looks pretty cool. I like that. So let's turn all of the layers off. And back on, and there we go. Or let's just turn the texture off and back on. Not bad, not bad at all. Uh, and just so you know you can do it, there's no reason why you can't add more than one texture. You can add a whole bunch if you want. 
So I'm going to put this one on top. And I'm going to do the same thing. Command T. And I'm going to make him fit. I've got some fun textures too. I've got some that are called it's raining and it's snowing. And so you can add snow and I've got some bokeh ones and it is just, I'm like a little kid in a candy store. And I actually like the look of overlay. That looks nice. And I'm gonna add a mask to that one too. Cause I do want to remove it. Again, big, big soft brush. Just kind of remove it a little bit. There we go. And maybe a little bit more in here. So this is just, you know, kind of a, a, a jump into my creative process. So I come in here and I play with these things and sometimes I'll put on a, a texture and I, and I don't like it at all. I'll try the blending modes and, and try masking and it just, uh, it just doesn't work. And, and there's no reason why, why you have to stick with something. So you can always come in here and do something different. Okay, let's do, have I got time for one more, Jay? Sure, why not? All right, this one, let's see. Uh, Kate, we have a question before you proceed. Do you oh, make sure. your own textures or do you purchase them? Um, I like went on like a texture bender <laughs> <laughs> for a while there. I have so many that I purchased. I'm almost ashamed to talk about it. <laughs> um, so yeah. I'm there with you, Kate. I have about 2,000 textures I yeah. bought. So don't worry about it. Okay, it's, it's, I don't feel um, so bad now because that's about yeah. how many I have. It's like two or 3,000. It's crazy. Yep, um, yep. So I purchased a lot and uh, I have a couple of favorite uh, companies that I purchased from. Um, I love Two Little Owls Studio. It's a nice lady out of Atlanta. Uh, French Kiss Textures, Flypaper Textures and things like that. Um, about a year or two ago, I started making my own. Um, I actually make them uh, on my iPad. I use an app called Procreate and I have started kind of painting and drawing in that app. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. So. For this one, I thought that this might uh, look kind of nice with a painterly look. So I'm going to bring this one into Topaz Studio and just give it a real quick, uh, what did I end up with? Little Van Gogh. I think it was Van Gogh. All the way at the bottom. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to click apply so that it kind of opens up this window here and then I'm going to come down and the only reason I'm going through this so quickly right now is because I did this once already this morning. So <laughs> um, The Van Gogh really, really brightened uh, this yellow up, I think, a little bit too much. So I'm actually going to target yellow in this program uh, and bring the lightness down so it just kind of tones that down and maybe desaturate it a little bit. Um, some of the painterly looks can do that. They can kind of oversaturate things. So I'm going to click accept and it'll just bounce it right back to Photoshop. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and flatten this. I mean, again, wouldn't normally do that, but I want to show you something else that's fun is I am going to light this lamp. How am I going to do that with a little Luminar AI? Uh, this is in Luminar 4 too, so if you haven't uh, upgraded to the Luminar AI, don't sweat it. It's in Luminar 4 as well. It's just in a different spot. So I'm going to click Edit, open this up, and I'm going to go to the Creative section here, and I'm going to click on Sun Rays, and I'm going to place my Sun Center right here in my lamp. And let's see, nice glowing sun. Maybe increase the number of rays or decrease the number of rays. Warm them up a little bit, just a smidge. And let's see, maybe reduce the penetration just a little bit. Kind of tweak it right behind that that bar there, or you can put it, well, no, it doesn't look right there. We'll just leave it right there. Okay, so now I have lit my lamp 
as well. How much fun is that? <laughs> so now we have a nice bright lamp in the middle of the day uh, on, a, on a painted image there. So that is just a, a very quick little 15 minute dive into something that I will normally spend uh, a, a lengthy amount of time with. So let me uh, stop sharing my screen here. And so we can see everybody. I'm gonna hand it back to Jay. Do you guys have any um, questions? I haven't had a chance to look. Uh, the iPad app. Yeah, I use an app called Procreate. Um, it has tons of uh, preset brushes that you can use, painterly brushes and uh, you know, charcoal drawing and, and all kinds of stuff. And uh, it, it's amazing it actually me starting to do textures is what got me into drawing. And so now I actually draw animals and uh, landscapes and things like that on the iPad. I mean, who knew? <laughs> you never know what you can do um, until you try. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I make them on there and I spit out a, a TIFF and bring it over to uh, my computer and then I can turn it into a, a JPEG or, or anything else or just add it as a TIFF. But uh, yeah, it's it's a really a really handy app and a lot of a lot of fun to play with. So I have to say that um, Kate has almost like twelve or so tutorials and online classes on Visual Builder just now, and she goes through a ton of these different techniques: textures, adding sun rays, painterly effects. Um, her black and white photography class, and she also has a phenomenal um, Photoshop layers and mask class. If you guys don't know how to use Photoshop layers and masks, this is a excellent starting class for everybody. So check it out. Um, I'll put a link to all of that. Um, you can get all of that, or you can get access to all of that through our streaming service. I'll put, uh, Kate, if you get a chance, put your um, link up there for the streaming service. Okay. And uh, remember, N2020 is a keyword to get 30% off the first year of streaming service. And we all want to end 2020. Um, all right, so our next presenter is Ugo Che. Ugo Che is a, is a travel photographer based out of Italy and he's coming us, to us live from Italy, his home. But I have to say that creative photography is highly effective when you're trying to take photograph and traveling at the same time. Because let's face it, you know, you're at a location, you're traveling and you don't always have the right conditions, correct? Uh, there are people in the shots, there is sun and your lens isn't working correctly or it's dirty. Uh, all of these problems, how do you get around to it, right? And so Ugo is gonna show us some of the creative photography tricks that you can take and make your travel photos stand out. But before we go there, I have to tell you that Ugo's tutorial can only be purchased or accessed via our streaming service. So just let you know that there's no purchasing Ugo's tutorials. Don't email me saying where is Ugo's tutorial because he doesn't have one, but his tutorial, his uh, online class are accessible on his streaming service. All right, Ugo, you're up. I'm gonna shut up. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, as you said, you don't always get, uh, when traveling, you don't always get the luxury of perfect conditions like the, the one that I found with the, the photo in my back here that I took in Rome a couple of years ago. That was a perfect condition, but sometimes you don't get the luxury and you're traveling and you cannot just wait for perfect light, uh, perfect weather and absence of people. So you need to, to make do what would with what you get. So uh, just to share my screen to, to start with, if we can find out. There you go. So, uh, and this presentation is going to be a continuation of the one uh, that we did a few weeks ago about creative travel photography when we addressed some of the problems that are typically, we typically encounter things like having power lines. We, we did a tutorial about how to effectively and quickly remove them, how to um, create panoramas, how to uh, balance uh, the sky with the ground light uh, at the night landscape photos and things like those. I believe 
uh, Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the recording of that webinar is available on the Visual Wilderness uh, streaming service. So yeah. what, I'm, what I'm going to do today is to present a couple of more of my um, tricks from my bag of tricks that um, that I've, uh, I've used over the years to, to overcome some of, some of those uh, situations. And one is lens flares. A lens flare, um, I like to, to shoot into the sun and not always you have uh, the, the luxury of having a nice red ball just setting or rising, but sometimes the, the sun is high in the sky, it's quite strong, you get blue sky. So sunshine shining directly into the camera, into the lens means that you get flare, uh, you so little blobs of color depending on your lens, especially if you use filters or any piece of glass in front of your camera, if in front of your lens, uh, you get uh, reduced contrast, uh, like colors can be a little washed out and so on. So I'm going to present one of that, one technique that I use in those situations. And in order to avoid uh, having troubles with uh, any software, uh, especially because my computer is pretty slow. I'm a poor photographer. I cannot afford a new computer. <laughs> so as I'm streaming and using Photoshop and Lightroom at the same time can be a bit of a, a stress on my computer. I'm going to try to share. Uh, I recorded this technique. So uh, share sound and optimize. Let's look at this photo. And uh, I took this uh, pointing the camera straight at the sun. And in this case, I was using a um, polarizing filter on my lens to uh, get rid of some of the glare on the surface of the water and increase the, the contrast in the trees. I also use a GND filter to darken the sky a bit. The combination of all this glass in front of my lens uh, created all those uh, artifacts, like those technically called ghost, these little colored blobs of light. In addition to that, it also somewhat reduced the contrast on, of, on the scene. This image has already been processed a bit to, to increase the contrast, but shooting into the sun typically um, causes the, the, the colors to, to wash out a bit and the image to, to lose contrast. So what I did in this case was I took another photo a few seconds later with exactly the same settings. The camera was on full manual, but putting a finger in front of the lens so that I could cover the sun. And as you can see, the difference is quite uh, obvious here, right? This is the without the finger, this is with the finger. I got rid of most of the... Um, ghosting there and I increase the contrast. You can see especially the surface of the water uh, in, in this case is much darker. And also that the trees, the areas in the trees, they, they retain more of their contrast. So how do you create a composite image, blending those two together uh, in order to get um, the sky from the first image? and uh, the foreground from the second image. Well, if you're starting from Lightroom, you can just select both photos and go to uh, Photo, Edit in, Open as Layers in Photoshop. If you're not using Lightroom, you can just open the photos from Photoshop directly or from Bridge and put them in separate layers in the same file. Now I have the two photos loaded as layers into the same file in Photoshop. And you can see here, if I hide the top layer, I can see the, the one below. I'm just going to move the, the one with the finger to the top, just because it's easier to see what I'm doing, but it's not really important. Uh, let me enlarge it a little bit. And now what I'm going to do is to create uh, a layer mask uh, for the top layer in order to hide the sky from it. And so I'm just going to select the top layer and click the layer mask button. This will create a layer mask. And now my, uh, the only operation I need to do here is to mask out, that is to paint black on the top layer in the areas that I want from it. And since I have a nice flat uh, uh, horizon here, I can simply use the gradient tool. If you have a more complicated horizon, you can use um, another uh, another tool to, to select your uh, the, the area that you want to apply the mask to, but it doesn't have to be uh, really precise uh, in this case. 
So let me just use the type X to get the black uh, color. And then I will use the gradient tool and type black on the top part, pretty much around this place here. Voila, you can see I've got the um, top from the uh, image without the finger and the bottom from the image with the finger, which has a lot less glare and ghosting. Of course, this is not a, a, a complete fix of the problem. Still some residual ghosting that the sun was very strong there, but I can easily get rid of it, for example, using the, the patch tool. And make sure you select the, um, the image, not the mask where you're painting on. And you can just drag a little border around the area and select an area to patch it with. Make sure the content aware uh, option is selected and it will go into to fix that easily. Uh, another thing that this technique will not fix, unfortunately, is all those dust spots that were on my sensor. And since I was using a small aperture in order to get the sun star effect, these are very visible. But this is, uh, these are easily fixed with the uh, healing brush. And for this, you need to select the bottom layer because this is where those spots are, not the top one which is hidden in those places. After saving my image in Photoshop, or maybe you can also flatten the layers if you don't need them anymore, and then coming back to um, Lightroom and applying some uh, so a few more fixes. This is the final image where uh, there is basically no glare and no ghosting left. Okay, that was uh, one. I have another. Uh, example of the same technique with some uh, a bit of differences so I'm going to share that one as well to present it. I wanted to show you another example of this technique um, again two images one with the, the finger on top of the sun and the other one without and um, the reason I wanted to show you this other example is because uh, uh, it illustrates one thing that might happen to you as it happened to me so what happened is that I wasn't probably very careful and I must have bumped into my tripod between uh, those two shots so the position of the camera moved slightly between them whereas in the previous example the two layers were perfectly aligned and here I'm already in Photoshop with the images loaded as layers into one file but here you can see if I uh, hide the top layer and I show the bottom one and I alternate you can clearly see that the camera must have moved between the two shots so I need to, to rectify this and the way to rectify this is to make sure that both layers are selected and then go to the um, edit menu sorry and do auto align layers Click on Auto, make sure you don't have any vignette removal or geometric distortion correction because you don't need those. Click OK. And the two layers will be aligned. And of course, I got, I'm going to lose some pixels, which I will take care of later. And again, uh, I'm going to add a layer mask to this one. Uh, make sure I've got I've selected black and use the gradient to remove the sky from the top layer like here and then I can just proceed to crop out the unwanted pixel using the crop tool pressing the C like this press enter and I've cropped it and uh, this is the Result, the layers are aligned, but I've got rid of all my um, lack of contrast, discoloration, and ghosts uh, in the foreground. Uh, I still have uh, those bright circles there, which are due probably to all the dirt I had on my lens or filter, uh, which I was not very careful to uh, clean and I cannot just uh, hide those and reveal the, the underlying layer because if I try to do it, uh, let's let, let's try to do it and see what happens here. So I can use a black brush and go to the mask there. Sorry, a white brush I need. So I'm pressing D and go there and reveal the layer underneath. 
And the problem is that the sky on the other layer is actually darker because of the reduced glare because of what's hiding the sun. So they don't match the colors of the sky um, beneath and the one on top don't match. So I cannot just uh, reveal the, the layer underneath. If I want to remove those artifacts, I would probably need to use something like the uh, like the spot healing brush. In order to do this, I need to make sure that I'm selecting uh, the bottom layer because this is where the sky is coming from. And then maybe make the size a little bigger like this and then paint over those to try to get rid of them as neatly as possible. This can be a bit of work. Yeah, you, you cannot just uh, uh, reveal the layer underneath, unfortunately. So whatever is near the sun, any uh, ghosts there or dust spots or so on, you have to, to remove them manually. This technique will only take care of your foreground, essentially. Okay, um, I heard there were some people that didn't get a really good sound from it, but maybe if you contact me, I can send you a copy of the of this, just, just the videos if you want. Um, the, the audio in the, the recording is pretty good. I did it with a, a nice microphone and everything. So if there's some problem with the audio on your side, it's probably due to the transmission over Zoom. I'm not really sure what's happening here. Uh, so this is, um, Technique that I use, I, I love shooting into the sun and just create some some cool uh, visuals. And uh, but it can also bring problems with it. And this is a technique that if I remember to use it, I will normally use it for uh, to, to get rid of those uh, those problems, those ghosts and flares and uh, reduce contrast and so on. Um, the other uh, technique I want to show you it has to do with removing people from photos, and especially from crowded places, which nowadays probably is not a big problem anymore, right? Finding a crowded place can be a bit difficult these days, but when I when I took that for the photo that I'm going to show you when I recorded that video, uh, it was a very uh, popular photo spot. It's called the Giants Causeway in Northern Ireland. And there's always people there, and I wanted to take a good photo, a good landscape photo without tourists in it. So how do I do it? So let me again show you how I did it. Here is the set of images I will be using for this demonstration. I set the intervalometer on my camera to take a photo every minute, and I let it run for 18 minutes. So now I have 18 pictures to, to work with. Um, you might be able to use fewer, or you might need to, to use more, depending on how much movement you have in your, uh, in your scene. So uh, let's have a look at them very shortly. So you see that some people stood in the same place for a while. I got this bag and white jacket here, which was there for a few minutes, and this will cause me, definitely cause me some problems later, but um, we will see how to fix it. Um, I, in Lightroom, I initially did some basic uh, toning, uh, setting the levels, the, the contrast uh, and sharpness of the image. And these are all shot in JPEG. I did this to, to conserve uh, space and speed. I'm not really interested in having um, using raw format for this exercise. So I'm going to select all the photos. I will click on the first, then shift click on the last so that they are all selected. And I will go to file, export. Uh, I will select a folder where to put them like this causeway folder. Uh, and I will export as JPEG with no resizing. And after export, I want to show them in Finder. So I'll let Lightroom do its job. Lightroom has finished exporting the 18 files. I'm going to switch to Photoshop. In Photoshop, I'm going to go to File, Scripts, Statistics. I'm going to choose Stacking Mode, Median. This is important. 
and use a folder. I'm going to browse the folder that was created, that was on their pictures, causeway. So I've got my 18 files, and I'm going to uh, choose a stack mode of medium. I'm also going to obtain to automatically align source images. Uh, the reason for this is that in this particular case, I was not very careful. And at some point during my shoot, I accidentally moved my tripod. And you see here between these two images, they're not perfectly aligned due to me moving the tripod. So I'm going to tell uh, Photoshop to align them all, which will, it will take a bit more time, but Photoshop is perfectly able to align them. So I'm going to click on OK. So now Photoshop is doing its job. It's opening all those images as layers. It's aligning them. And now it renders the final image computing the median of all the values. What the median operation do is to basically select for every, for the final image, selecting for every pixel, the one that is most, most frequently appears in, in all the images. So it will create an image which contains everything that is not moving. So here we are. Uh, this is the, the result of that operation. Now you can immediately notice that this image is not perfect. There are some issues. Uh, you see some ghosts here where people actually stood there for quite a bit. So Photoshop was not able to, to find sky bits to use. And here, there's like a ghost of those handbags, the white jacket, and so on. So we, we will need to get rid of those. Uh, another observation is that the sea and the sky, they, they look a bit soft. This is because the median operation averaged out a bit all the, the motion of the waves and the, the clouds in the sky. Uh, you might want to keep this in this case. It looks like a bit of a long exposure. Or uh, you might want to get rid of it. And we'll see how to do that in a minute. So how do we restore proper um, pixels, bits in, this, in these areas here? What we're going to do is go, we are going to select um, an image from our, light, our stack of images that only has background in these positions. So let, let's try to find one, uh, one that has, doesn't have this handbag. And this one looks clean enough, and it might work. So I'm going to go to the photo menu, click Edit In, Edit in Adobe Photoshop CC 2014. So now we're back in Photoshop, and we have two images. I'm going to uh, tell them so you, we can see them both. Before we go to the next step, we need to take this image here, which is still a stacked image. It actually contains uh, layers. Now we're going to flatten it so we can proceed with our work. So we're going to do go to layer, flatten image, and we'll combine all the layers into one. And then we take this one, and we need to drag this layer on top of the other one. And we want these, these layers to be aligned. So I'm going to uh, click on the Shift key and then drag this layer on top of the other image. Uh, it says you want to proceed. These are different bit depths, but we don't care about this at, at this point. Uh, let's close this one. We don't need it anymore. So we now have our um, image which is composed of two layers. On top we have, uh, let's say, the, the one that contains the good bits for the C and doesn't have the handbag. If we hide this layer, we can see the other one 
uh, with the ghosts. Um, don't worry about the fact that two layers are a bit misaligned. We are going to align them momentarily by clicking on both of them using the Shift key, then going to email to uh, edit and click auto align layers, select the auto mode, click on OK, and now the two images have been aligned, as you can see by hiding this one, the background doesn't shift uh, in position. Um, I'm going for this particular image to take the top layer and put it at the bottom, so now I see uh, my combined image on top, and I'm going to add a mask to the top layer. So I'll click on the mask button. This is a white mask. And then I'm going to hide the parts of the mask that contain the bits that I don't want to be shown. So I'm selecting the black color, and I'm selecting a brush. I will use a large brush. I because I want to proceed quickly, and just going over here and erasing the top layer. So you can see that the handbag and the other ghost is gone. I want to do the same with these ghosts here and the sky and the sea too. So now the sea is getting sharp again. I'm using a brush with a bit of feathering, but you can actually go over the other bits the parts of the background because they are aligned, so you shouldn't really worry about them. I'm also going to paint all over the sky to restore a good sky. Don't don't care about those borders, which are coming from the fact that the two layers were not perfectly, uh, the two images were not perfectly aligned. We're going to go and crop them out later. So let's restore good parts of the sea and of the sky. I'm just going to, you see there's uh, this person here that is a bit annoying, but don't worry about that for the moment. I'm going, the images are not exactly the same tone. This is something that I should have uh, fixed earlier uh, when I was in Lightroom. Let's get rid of all the white bits there. Okay, and now I am going to get rid of this person here by hitting the X key, which will give me a white uh, brush. I'm going to make it smaller, and I'm going to restore some of the top layer to get rid of that person. This worked pretty well. I'm going now to hit the C key to crop my image so I don't see those, those borders that result from the slight misalignment of the two images. Yep. I'm cropping a bit at the top too, just in case. Just a lot, probably just the one pixel difference up there. Hit enter, and here is our clean image. Now I will save this one. I'm saving it to the desktop as a Photoshop file. Uh, wait a second, I forgot one step, that is flattening the image. We don't need all those layers now that we have finished. So let's go save. Save as Photoshop, I already had a previous version, so uh, I'm going to save as Photoshop, or even as JPEG. I mean, I don't care at this point. Let's save as JPEG. At maximum quality. Okay, now let's go back to Lightroom and import this image again using import photos and videos. Uh, let's select the desktop. I've got a bunch of stuff in here, but this is the one I'm going to use, the JPEG. Import it into Lightroom. And here we have our image where we have removed all the people, uh, 
those annoying tourists that were in all of our photos. I finally did some work in Lightroom, converted the image to black and white, gave it a bit of a warmer tone, uh, work on the levels, the, the clarity, contrast, uh, and, and so on to get the, the, the final result that I, that I really wanted. My Giants Causeway picture with no people in it. Okay, sorry about the audio quality. I don't know what was up there with the transmission, but as Jay was saying, if you will send the original files to, to everyone who signed up for it, so they will be able to see it full res and full audio. Um, I saw there was a question about, right, uh, is this creative photographer, is this image manipulation? Um, my personal, for this type of photo, my personal opinion is that uh, the Giants Causeway is there. I mean, I did not create something that was not there, right? I just got rid of, a, of an annoying distraction that was people. There is no, it's a very popular spot and people will just go on those rocks to take photos on themselves and their friends or just watch the watch the panorama and so on. It's, it's cool to be there and it's, you cannot just ask those people to go away. So what can you do? Uh, I think this is for some contests. If I wanted to present this as a reportage type of photo, of course it's manipulated, but it's, I did not create anything that was not originally there. I just removed anything that happened to pass in front of it for a few seconds by combining multiple real images. So that up to you, uh, whatever, <laughs> whatever works for you. Um, I'm happy. So thank you, Ugo, for uh, that. And I wanted to wrap this up for everyone. One of the things I do want to say about Ugo's technique is we will send out a videos to all who have registered for this uh, webinar. Um, but this particular technique is something that we use quite regularly. One of the best use of this technique is to shoot in the rain. Now, let me explain how we use it in the rain. You know, you, you have your front element and you take a photo in the rain. And obviously sometimes the raindrops will fall on the lens and will create distortions. Well, what we do is we, we take a cloth, we wipe it off, we take another photo and chances are the raindrops will fall at a different place. And we take three or four photos and use exactly the same technique that Ugo showed to actually get a super clean image of whatever we are photographing. We photographed um, landscape photography using this technique in some of the most wet conditions that you will ever encounter. All right, so I just wanna let you guys know that this isn't just for travel photographers. Um, creative photography like this, or creative thinking, out of box thinking like this will get you photos that you possibly cannot get by just thinking golden hours and, oh, I'm just going to shoot like a normal landscape photographer. So again, all these techniques that you saw are available for our special offers. You guys can go to Visual Wilderness and grab one of these things for like $29 if you want. Ugo stuff is available to uh, subscribers and uh, visual streaming subscribers. I put in a code. If you guys want to sign up for that, go ahead and sign up at a fairly discounted rate for first year. Um, we have almost 50 plus tutorials, online classes. And the thing about our streaming services, next time we put on a workshop and Padma comes and presents this exploding flower or some really cool stuff, it'll be available to you for free for streaming subscribers, all right? Um, that brings us to the end of our presentation. I am going to ask if I'm going to stop my share and see if people have questions um, while we're here. Um, anybody have any questions to any of us? We'll be glad to answer. And um, otherwise, we'll be doing more of these with uh, the TWIP as our partner, as well as on Visual Wilderness. Yeah, I have a question. Um, how can I get to that island? That's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to come with me next time we go there. <laughs> we can either swim there, get a boat, 
<laughs> or take a helicopter and drop you off. <laughs> I just, it looks so gorgeous. I'm just, for some reason, I cannot get warm today, no matter how many layers <laughs> I put on. And it's just, it's so inviting right now. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'll uh, look for another one of our free webinars and online workshops coming up soon. All right. All right. Bye, Have everybody. Days, everybody.